So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you all get in the driver's seat in terms of both comments, observations, uh, questions, and or reactions you had to the panelists, the presentations, or anything else that you've heard so far. Hi, my name is Allison Lewis, and I work at Jewish Vocational Service of Los Angeles. And several of you have mentioned that you've developed contracts with outside partners, be they employers or nonprofit organizations or government agencies, to provide literacy services for them. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the nuts and bolts of those relationships, how you develop those contracts, what they look like, et cetera. Well, I do a contract that is usually a year long. Um, I, I base my budget on everything it's going to cost me plus a little bit more. Because when you're a nonprofit, you can make profit on some parts of what you do as long as you funnel it back into those other parts of what you do. So I think it's just fine <laughs> to make a little profit on something that you're doing. Um, so we build in some overhead um, into the contract. But mostly it is the wages the taxes, the benefits, the books, the copier, the, you know, all of those things. Then the contract is usually just a personal services contract, and they we say we're going to do adult literacy services. Sometimes they want an MOU that you spells out, you know, you're going to offer X number of classes, uh, this, you know, for an hour or two hours or whatever it is, and you're going to provide the instructor, they're going to provide the classroom. So everybody knows what, who's doing what, um, usually I make them find the people and um, put them in the class and then we serve them. So um, it, it, uh, it's all spelled out in the contract and then sometimes they want you to report once or twice a year. Um, often they don't even ask for reporting, um, but I always collect information just in case, keep attendance, all those things, so that we can make a report back to them and let them know what we did. And I, our contracts are different depending on the program um, and who it's with. We have two contracts with Pima County, one with the county library system and the other with the Pima County One Stop. And they have, you know, their legal department. So it's a very involved, intricate contract. But the, to figure out the funding, um, for the one stop, it's a basic literacy class, which is was new for us just a little over a year ago. And so I did figure that just the way Karen just described, you know, on all the staff costs and so forth. For our English language classes that we do all over Tucson in libraries and uh, schools, for the ones that we get paid for, which are just the library ones, um, I actually sat back one day and realized what our whole budget goes to is recruiting and training tutors. So I just took our entire budget, divided it by the number of tutors we have, and then figured if I have three tutors in a classroom for X number of hours, that's what it costs. So very simple. <laughs> I don't really have anything to, to add to it except for the MOU. Um, Usually it just starts, well, let me use this. <coughs> Everything's personal, so um, Word hasn't gotten to the point where we've got uh, the contracts that I think I've previously mentioned I envy. Um, but uh, a lot of MOUs, and a lot of it is just meeting the right person in the organization. It's, it's amazing that as big as the world gets and is digitized, that everything's still personal. So just getting to that person, a lot of time these, times the organizations are going to, if it has to go beyond that, they're going to direct you you know, where to go through their legal department and what they, what they expect. So that's really the only thing I've got to add. Right, and well, right, we're not, char we're not charging at this point. Oh. So, we're, we're, so we're volunteering, we're sending volunteer tutors into different places. So the MOU is just kind of just jumping off on one of these guys, say just uh, specifying what each, each party is responsible for. And our county contracts are all reimbursement contracts. So we have to, you know, every we have to bill every month for what we just did that month. So we have to keep very careful records. 
You know, one of the byproducts of this session is that uh, this also provides great information, data for pro-literacy in terms of thinking about some roles that we could play. And it certainly occurs to me that something we have not done is to begin to develop some samples of both MOUs, contracts, both the models, and also the explicit products themselves. It makes sense. We've had projects around accountability and other kinds of areas, but I think that's something else that we could probably do about that. Maddie Riddle, Centro Latino for Literacy. And I have two questions, and I guess the first question is, um, do you charge any type of fee for, or do you have an alumni club, for example, where you might have found that some of the people that are learners have actually be become contributors and have become donors? And I was just wondering, because I know, Rod, you had talked about that, you know, because many of the, the, the some of them are tutors, et cetera. And, but I was just wondering from Betty and Karen, have you had um, experience with uh, the clients actually becoming funders? or paying any type of fee? Um, our students don't pay any kind of fee. Um, and we have maybe a handful of students every year that make small donations. It's nothing we pursue at all. A year ago, we started a student ambassador program. Mm -hmm. um, I anticipate, it's not a reason for doing it, but I would guess a few years from now, some of those student ambassadors may become donors. but. It's not been a strategy for us, no. I would say very similar. We, we have had people give us money that um, were business owners that we taught to read, and or we helped one get a citizenship. So they had the money to give back to us, and they did. We do have students who will ask us, you know, I want to pay for this, or is there any way I can, you know, I feel bad, I should be paying you something for all you're doing for me. So we just always tell them, you can make a donation to the organization if that's what you'd like to do, but we're not going to charge you. So. Great. And then my, my second question is um, that we, uh, our organization has developed and focuses on Spanish language, native language literacy, and I'm just wondering, um, have you seen the need for that, because that's one of our sustainability strategies, is to link up with groups that are doing this, and that's a niche that we might be able to help. Yes, we we have run into um, people who are illiterate in Spanish, trying to learn English, how much harder that is to do. Um, and we have a lot of farm workers, so we have people who have very little education in their own language. So we have seen that need, yes, we could have that need, but right now we stick to teaching them English. Um, we had a little bit of like a volunteer helping them learn learn Spanish literacy, but we haven't done it as a program. We see that also, but it's not just Spanish. We have a large refugee population from, you know, just all over, and many of them are not literate in their own language, so it's not as simple as just one language. Um, so we work with the refugee resettlement groups in trying to come up with strategy and curricula to work with preliterate adults who are trying to learn English, but it's, it is very difficult. Yeah, so same thing in Palmdale. We have a, a pretty big, I, I would think, probably anywhere in California. I, I mean, that's, that's a niche that the schools are just uh, overwhelmed, the bilingual schools, the... Um, you know, the ones that try immersion and everything else. It's a, There's never enough um, help. So I would say that's a good niche. And I just kind of wanted to really quickly go back to your first question. Um, so never knowing where donations come from, um, I had a learner who came up to me last year and said she couldn't afford to give, but she, uh, she and her husband were friends with some of the local doctors and attorneys in town, and they knew that she was going through the literacy program, would like to you know, make a yeah, isn't everything personal as far as donations go? I mean, when you get down to it, it's that whole you strategy that Betty talked about, and they and they donated you know several hundred dollars just because she was in the program. So just another you know sometimes it's not the person um, asking; it's who they know and who they they know friend of a friend. Yeah, we have one student's mother who gives between five hundred and a thousand dollars every year. Great. And, and um, just one of our co-founders of pro-literacy has been developing material around sp uh, Spanish language literacy work. Jane Hugo could tell you a little bit more about that in terms of the work that Ruth Colvin has been doing. Other, other questions? Yeah. Right. Um, I was wondering, um, in regards to all of your having programs and teaching people to read, I'm curious to know how long you teach them for 
Um, I'm curious to know how much, how many of your students succeed, and for what, under what period of time, and to what grade levels they improve. Is that possible to give me an estimate or an overview? <coughs> Best guess. Well, <coughs> here's my first problem: is we serve everybody from literacy to learning English to getting their GED to, you know, so. Um, in each category, it's a different story. And like, like Rod was saying, when it comes to literacy, there's no, they're, they're all over the map. So we have people who have been able to get where they wanted to get in a year. We have people who still aren't there and they've been in our program for five or six or more years. Um, so that one's really hard to answer. Um, we did... Just the facts and figures from last year were 80% of our learners who had at least 50 hours of instruction made a learning gain in reading. Made a what? I'm sorry. A learning gain. So they went up in their standardized testing. When learning gain would be like one like year? Like going up at least three points. So it's about, it's not, it's probably six months to a year. Yeah. Um, we have others in our English program, they go up faster um, generally. So they'll make gains of an average of 8 to 10 points, which is probably two grade levels for some of them. Um, so, you know, I, it's easier to, I think, when you're already literate in one language to transfer that skill to English than it is to get literate. So um, the people the learning English tend to have higher gains than people learning to read. Does that answer your question, at least from my viewpoint? Yeah, that's great. Anybody else? the same really it just varies all over the map sometimes a student will come in and in six or nine months be reading to the level that they were wanting to attain and they go off and do whatever their their goal was other students are with us for years our poster child student was with us for eight years she came as she was a high school graduate was accepted at Pima Community College but she read at a third grade level and she knew she was going to really struggle so she came in to us for tutoring help while she went through Pima. It took her six years. She got three associate degrees, then went on to the U of A. Last year, she finished her accounting degree. She's now an accountant for the U of A, and she's currently studying for her CPA. But um, she still doesn't write very well. <laughs> but she's really good at math. And I, I just have to echo what Karen and Betty said. I, I mean, it's, it really varies according, uh, according to the learner. Um, and how do you define success? I, I think Betty, Betty kind of touched on that. I mean, yeah, the poster child uh, learners who go on and achieve great, a great job or great act. It's something that's very easy to measure. But I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of, um, a couple of learners who came into our program, and they're still not the greatest readers, and writing is always more difficult anyway. But uh, their whole thing was they wanted to get out in the community and, and give back in their own in their own church or uh, uh, one guy one guy's involved in getting young African American people out of jail into the workforce. So is he reading at a twelfth grade level? No, um, and sometimes he thinks he reads better than he does, and he still you know he still um, has his issues. But he's doing what he stated his goal was to set out for. So I, one of the lines I used to use when when uh, the program was was in effect was you know wouldn't it be great if everybody could read Shakespeare and you know, uh, math books and, and do trigonometry and, and understand history. But that's not what most of the learners come in for. It's, it's really in, li in the literacy, in the volunteer literacy field anyway. Um, they're looking to make small, substantial gains in, in their lives. And sometimes they exceed those expectations amazingly. But I, I know you had a reason for asking the question. I don't, I don't know if we have time to, to hear sort of your, your comment, just having talked to you at the break. But I think uh, I'll... I'll Talk individually to people instead of making an announcement or anything. You know, and the biggest gain so many of our students make, and sometimes fairly quickly, is self-esteem. They start to believe in themselves. And that's huge success. You know, we had a student, he's, we started doing um, intensive basic literacy classes a little over a year ago. So some of our students tutor 20 hours a week. Um, and he went to a book sale. This is a guy who could barely read when he started. Went to a book sale, and he picked up Shel Silverstein's, what is it, The Missing Piece? Is that what it? And he picked it up, and he said, I found my missing piece. Thanks to you guys, I found my missing piece. 
I, I did you know, one, one more question. I'm sorry. Let me just make yeah. a quick comment though about that particular observation, oh, and please. that is that the um, you know they did a landmark study about uh, adult literacy students a number of years ago, and in it one of the key questions was why did you come to an adult literacy program? And of course most of us, well I shouldn't say most of us, but a lot of us would have said, you know, it's typical, a better job, read your children, wanted to read in church, wanted to be able to you know, interact with the community or get your citizenship. Those were all two, three, four, five. Uh, number one, across the board, and this was across the board, uh, out of all areas, was they came, the majority of them said, when really asked, they came to feel better about themselves. So that whole question about motivation and about self-esteem is really important. So yeah, one of the things, a, a strategy that we instituted um, about two years ago, but when we moved into our larger building a year and a half ago, we're really able to do this. We now have a drop-in tutoring center. So, and it's really good. Some of our volunteers who don't have a lot of time to tutor, they can come to a drop-in center once a week for a couple hours. So we have these drop-in centers four different times throughout the week. So when a new student comes in and is assessed, they can start tomorrow. There is no waiting time. So we don't lose any students because they start to get a little doubtful or fearful or that low self-esteem takes over again. So th that's been a strategy that's really worked well for us. And now we have other classes as well, so they can, they can literally start probably within an hour. Yeah. Uh, Greg, you, you had one more comment? Go ahead. I was just going to add on to the, uh, what was said there. I think the biggest problem why it's so hard to determine how long it's going to take is that there a lot of people come because they don't have the skills because they have not had the experience of school, basically. Others are there because they have an underlying learning disability. And that's where you end up with the big discre discrepancies. Yeah, could you just say a little bit more about your uh, outcome measures? Because I, I, I resonate with that a lot, and I really, uh, um, and I really appreciate the importance of uh, a single anecdote is an anecdote. Anecdote times uh, 100 are case studies. But there's also the issue of uh, quantification, even of the uh, even of the outcomes. But in any event, because a uh, low literacy in particular, I mean, I ran programs with people reading sub first grade level and for years, but they're still getting a lot out of the program, and I could document that through uh, through interviews, through talking, through observation, et cetera. But in any event, what uh, what could you be more uh, could you be concrete? Give us some concrete examples of what your outcome measures look like. The non testing outcome measures. Yeah, we have a, a monthly log that tutors fill out, so as well as tracking, you know, the days they taught and the number of hours and which students attended and so forth. On the back of that sheet, then, are, we call them our, our outcome buckets, you know. And so they just fill in, so for this student, you know, he he's now able to do, you know, and they just check it off. It's just a check. Oh, oh, um, got a library card, read to their child, now able to read um, a newspaper, read medical instructions, talk to their child's teacher, talk to the doctor in English. Um, there's, like in the citizens group area, there's things like um, registered to vote, voted for the first time, um, is involved in the community, some sort of community activity. They now volunteer in their community. Things like that. Does that does that help? Grow a little bit in skill development. So it's not an absolute quantity. Generally speaking, it's a, I can do better with these things. And of course, it's all self-report. He says with a question, maybe not, uh, but but maybe not. Or tutor observation. Um, Ours is very similar. Um, in fact, I was going to tell you, CaliforniaLibraryLiteracy.org. Did I get that right? LibraryLiteracy.org. LibraryLiteracy.org. Thank you. Um, it has a website, and on that website is a form called Roles and Goals, and it is a way to capture it, and you can just download the form. Yeah, again, I would just you know, echo... Uh, Betty and Karen on a lot of it and a lot of the yeah the roles and goals form is sort of the template that 
seems to have sparked people. Uh, we're, we're considering using it up in Palmdale as well and modifying it to include things like uh, increase in self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, and I understand that's not what you're looking for. Um, I just kind of want to go back back to my earlier phase about pounding the, the uh, square peg in the round hole. I mean, I'm looking at other, um, and it, again, it's just a food for thought thing. I'm looking at other agencies that rely on hard data and numbers and, you know, Wall Street springs to mind, meteorology springs to mind, and it's like, yeah, I think, I think it's vastly overrated, and especially in a soft science like literacy, um, where self-esteem, again, Betty, Betty's right on, uh, hit, the, hit the nail on the head. Um, a lot of it is feeling like you're part of something greater and that you can do it. There's so many filters that go through getting to reading and writing. I said earlier, I, I thought it was all going to be about the ABCs and the 18 vowel sounds and all this, and so little of it was actually the mechanics of that. And I think, it, I think we ignore that at our, at our peril if you're just looking for crunching numbers. And I understand the whole world's moving that way, and, you know, um, and, that, and that's fine. That it is what it is for funding, and, and there's, not, it's, there's nothing wrong with people uh, accomplishing goals that can be measured. But, yeah, I just, again, that's my, that's my evangelical uh, <laughs> uh, thing on it. Liter literacy, is, literacy is not that. You, you just can't nail it down. You know, we do something simple, similar in mental health. I said, what's a positive outcome? Well, if they stay out of the hospital or if they're not homeless, you know, for six months, you know, we want to be able to report that. And I'll dutifully do that, but how sad is that? That that's, that's what we're basing funding and, and stuff on. You know, the negative, the negative positive outcomes, I guess. Yes, he didn't go into the hospital for the six-month period. So I, I, just see, I just hear a lot of the same conversation with literacy. You know, that reminds me, I worked on a project a few years back, and they used a sense of community as an evaluation measure. And I started learning and looking on the net. There's this whole... It's outside of education and literacy, but it's a valuable, um, viable evaluation, a sense of community. How safe does someone feel in their neighborhood? Do they know their neighbors? How many people do they talk to in their neighborhood? If they had a problem, is there someone they could go to? I thought, there's a whole other world out there using that as outcome measures, and that's something we could sure, certainly tie into. Uh, other questions or observations? Yeah, this table is talking. Um, yeah, we're going to have to restrict you, I hear. I come from an outside field into literacy, and so I think one of the things that has um, sort of just been one of the most difficult things to sort of wrap my arms around is, number one is that literacy, many people immediately think children. And, you know, and they even when they talk about family, it's like it's the whole family. And it's just like, well, parents don't know how to read, how to read or write. How do you do that? So that's one of the biggest obstacles I see, you know, in funding or anything, because there's so much funding for children's literacy, but very little for adults. So just wondering, you know, what have you, what are your comeback? <laughs> you know, what are your, uh, what, what are the first things that come out of your mouth when people say, oh, yes, I love little kids. Let me give you books. Um, you know, and it's like, no, we're talking about adults, you know. Um, so that's that's number one. And then I guess the other thing, too, is that um, I keep thinking about these very large initiatives of foundations, which are neighborhood-based foundation, you know, neighborhood-based impact, where they bring all of this money, you know, Merrill Lynch, um, Jacobs Foundation here in San Diego. I mean, all of this stuff for neighborhood, which is absolutely wonderful. It's a regional impact. But how do we get that conversation of illiteracy at that table, where when you're funding a neighborhood initiative where so many people are going this way and so many foundations are going this way, that literacy is not an afterthought, but it's at the planning table, that if you don't integrate literacy in these foundation initiatives, you're missing just to what everyone's saying. It's like it's the crux, right? And so I think that's where I think pro-literacy would be a wonderful advocate, because we need to get at that level of funding up there in those innovative you know, initiatives that are coming out and people jump on it. It's because it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. So That's great. Well, th that'll be a great segue into our next section. But before we do that, because I'm going to bring David Harvey on up, I'm curious to see what our local program directors think about it. On your first question, um, my first response usually is, um, 
if that child is struggling reading, good chances are there's a parent at home who is struggling to read as well. And the other thing we use is Tom Stitt did a neat thing. He calls it double duty dollars. Every dollar that's given, you know, for adults impacts the child as well. So we talk about both those a lot. We talk about parents being the first t and best teacher of their child and how um, basically what she said that uh, if a child has a literate parent in the home, that's their best chance. And um, I read something, somebody had this quote, and I'm, I'm going to not say it right, but it stuck with in my head. It was like, it was, let's not have heads start. Let's start with the heads of the parents. I was like, oh, I love that. <laughs> so, but um, I haven't actually ever said that. But that's, I think that's the point that we need to make is it starts with the parents, and, and that's the best foundation for the family. Just real quick, ditto on, on everything. It really is a generational issue. I, I'm always amazed that you know, what I do now is uh, I'm a case manager, and I go into people's homes and the first thing I look for are magazines, you know, newspaper subscription. Is there a bookcase? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but there were times in my life when I didn't have furniture, but I had a bookcase, you know. So, I, I mean, if, if it's not, if reading's not part of the, uh, the culture, then um, that's, that's where you start. And that's, that's the slippery and difficult thing with literacy. Yeah, the kids are adorable. Uh, the area I come from, we give generously to children's causes. I think we're, we're number two or three in L.A. County, and we're a much smaller region. But when it comes to adults, we're also a very conservative community, and that means pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, and why didn't you get it in school, and you must be lazy and stupid and on welfare and all that kind of stuff. So trying to get past those issues is enormous, and everybody comes from different communities, so you, you deal with those issues where you can. Um, but a lot of what was already said that, yeah, the adults are the ones that are, this used to be common sense. Is this like something that like adults teach children and pass it down? And, and we, it seems like we've lost, um, we've lost a little bit of that. And part of the greater discussion is we don't do long term very well anymore in this country. Um, and so it's all short term solutions and, you know, bang, bang, let's fix it now. And adult literacy is usually a longer haul than that. Uh, join me in thanking our panel for a terrific <laughs> presentation out there.